New seasons mean new seasonal recipes, and now it's easier than ever. With fresh ingredients delivered to your door, HelloFresh brings the farmer's market to you. Get 16 free meals plus three free gifts with code AWFUL16 at HelloFresh.com slash AWFUL16. And then the doctor's like, oh, you know, we could re- recommend a good grief counselor for you because, you know, the doctor doesn't know the awesome power of God yet. Yeah. This is a Christian movie, Bingo Square, we are sorely in need of. The doctor who's just doing their job and the other person retelling the story as the doctor being like, let me tell you, that's one dead son. Do you mind if I eat him before he gets cold? (laughs) (laughs) You gonna finish that son? God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema, because if we switch to biannual six-hour history lectures, you'd notice. I'm your host, <laughs> No Illusions, and sitting 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend, Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, Noah. Marky Mark movie, I'm so excited. Oh, yeah. They, like I said, I, I said last week I had a little advent calendar that was a bit of an exaggeration, but man, this one, <laughs> I don't want to say didn't disappoint. It, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Just a tiny little Marky Mark chocolate for each day. Yeah, right? exactly. Yes. Right, yeah. But first, sitting at 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? If the last chocolate in that advent calendar isn't his giant fake penis from Boogie Nights, (laughs) it's not a good (laughs) advent calendar. Oh, we got so many good merchandising opportunities from this point. Okay, so tell us, Heath, what will we officially now, what will we be breaking down today? We watched Father Stew in theaters It's the story of an escalating series of terrible, sad, dark things happening to Mark Wahlberg. And somehow it's still bad. It's really, despite that amazing Yeah, right, you just really (laughs) oversold. It's bad. It's really bad throughout. A lot of my notes are just like, this is bad. Yeah. I don't like this movie. Super bad. Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love conversations with your mom that start, you remember Debbie Howitzer's cousin's husband, don't you? You used to play with their kid at the <laughs> lake, I think. But you wish they ended with the suffering of the ill and the infirm is the best way to bring you to Jesus. You will love this movie. Won't you, though? Yeah, so I had an interesting how bad was this movie that came from the fact that we saw it in theaters. The theater I'm in, I always show up kind of early because I like to sit in the back because I have to have a little light to take notes and I don't like people sitting behind me because... That fucks them up when they're trying to watch the movie. So I'm there like 12 minutes before the movie starts. They're playing the whole like, you know, before the movie trivia, whatever with whoever. Maria Menounos, of Thank course. You. I, I thought I had her name, but I didn't. Fellow podcaster Maria Menounos. There you go. Yeah, our colleague. So, yeah, but then like something happens in their fucking system crashes and I get this error message. It's just blue screen of death with a big error message. And this sound starts to play. Now, I'm playing it quiet for you because, you know, you're listening to this on your fucking computer. So this is deafeningly loud for me for <laughs> 12 fucking minutes. For 12 minutes. That was not the least pleasant part of the theatrical experience. Yeah. No, the next two hours must have been worse. <laughs> I saw the movie now. This was the high point, actually, in a lot of ways. Look back on it fondly. <laughs> So is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Okay, best, best noise at the beginning of Noah's thing, first of all. Yep, sure. Also, best, worst motorcycle accident. Oh, Oh my God. God. So it doesn't sound like it, but it's really funny. It's really fucking funny. Like, there's a motorcycle accident, and each thing that happens... I laughed harder and harder because it, oh, it keeps getting Rube worse. Goldberg ass. Yeah. yeah. It's so stupid. It is as though they were like, oh, Eli hasn't laughed loudly enough in this movie theater full of Catholics. <laughs> Let's really get him with a seventh impact. Oh, just it, it, listeners, if you're imagining him like crashing into a balloon that pops, that scares a chicken, that lays an egg <laughs> onto a ramp, you have pretty much nailed it in your head. <laughs> Marky Mark might as well have like a fight against the chicken like family guy throughout like a a motorcycle crash. It's so good. Complete with like goat simulator graphics too. So I was going to go with 
another theatrical experience for me. Best worst elderly couple that was not ready for this many f bombs. <laughs> for, I, I have no idea why they decided to you know load this movie up with so much profanity. But there's like I, I actually Tim posted the exact count from Dove dot com or whatever or dot org. There's 103 profanities in this movie, including 44 uses of the word fuck. Really? Jesus. Yes. Fuck. Yeah. No, it's Tarantino esque in its uses is a, a usage of fuck. And the elderly couple that was the only other people in the theater with me were just not at all ready for that. Mm -mm, not having a good time. The the Michigan Christians were into it. They were like, yeah, fucking fuck, fuck that guy. It was pretty funny. They enjoyed it. All right. There you go. And of course, I'm gonna go with best worst. Fat suit for no reason. Yeah. We'll get to it. I don't want to spoil it. We will get to it. <laughs> yeah. You know, because it's going to seem for a very long time that we are not moving towards anything at all. It's probably best if you know that we're moving towards a best worst fat suit for no reason. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I've seen the crumps, too. So Why like, keep in mind. Why fat suit? Right. <laughs> no, no sense. No I reason. I want to talk about it for several hours. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, this movie takes about an hour and 20 minutes to get going, so I feel like we can at least get away with a skit and an ad right here. We're going to pause for a quick break. We'll be back in a minute with all the stagnant storytelling of Father Stew. Hi, welcome to typical fancy coffee store. How can I insult you while I'm selling you something? Oh, uh, what, just don't do that? No, it's too late. Don't. You're already in here. Can I interest you okay. in the wacky mo tacky? It's a blend from East Machadawa. It's just $900 a bag, and you will not like it. Oh, um, I was actually looking for just reasonably priced coffee that fits my taste profile. Oh, I see. Well, then you want trade. Trade for what? Uh, I have scratch and sniff stickers. No, Do you, you want trade for ignorant for rube. Trade Coffee connects customers to the freshest and best tasting coffee they've ever made at home by partnering with the country's best craft roasters. These are independent businesses from big cities and small towns. Trade customers are truly impactful for these independent roasters, often being the largest source of new growth for them. Wow. So I can support small independent roasters right from home? You sure can. But am I going to like the coffee? You sure will. Trade is so confident they'll match you right the first time that if they don't, they'll take your feedback and an actual coffee expert will work with you to send a brand new bag for free. It's true. When Trade became a sponsor, they sent us a three-month trial and I was so impressed. I signed up myself. Okay, but what are you doing here at the fancy coffee store, Eli? We talk about card tricks. It's true. I come here to oh, talk about okay. Yeah, that tracks. All right. Well, Trade Coffee sounds awesome. Where do I sign up? Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash awful. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking the quiz at drinktrade.com slash awful and let Trade find a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash awful for $30 off. All right. Looks like I'm going to go. Oh, hey, before you do, would you like to see me do a card trick? Oh, okay. Uh, is it good? No. Yeah, why not? Let's see a trick. Nice. See, I told you you'd say yes. I enjoy a medium trick. <laughs> hey, you must be Steve. That's me. All right. Welcome to Team Wahlberg, Steve. So right. uh, let me give you the 411. Mr. Wahlberg just finished his workout, his hour of prayer, and his cryo chamber time. We have 22 minutes before his 7.30 a.m. golf game to pitch him movies in one sentence or fewer. Sorry, one sentence? But he prefers fewer. Okay. Ah, nothing like a good cryo chamber to stop me from crying. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's what you're supposed uh, uh, to do with the Steve. I, Steve, right? Yeah. Movie pitches. Um, we bought a zoo too. Ah, pass. They didn't let me fight the penguins in the first one. Okay. Uh, uh, Boston gangster is from Boston. Already did that one this year. Okay, dude, we're running out of scripts. Just, we just go, just go. Okay, uh, so, uh, okay, what about this? The worst person you know made the worst decision you know, and on an unrelated note, that person is dying. Mm, that's pretty fucking good, bro. But, uh, dying for Jesus. Oh, fuck yeah, bro. <laughs> that's a move. And we're back for the breakdown, and I guess everybody's notes start in the previews, <laughs> so that's where we should start the show as well. I am sorry, Noah. My theater booed the Jurassic Park trailer because oh it my had God, dinosaurs, dinosaurs? In it. because it's historically inaccurate. <laughs> Interesting. Also, 
I just want to throw this out there. We all have notes on the new Liam Neeson movie where he's an assassin with Alzheimer's. And can I just say, the Christian movie audience is not the people you want to send the message. You don't have Alzheimer's. You really are seeing child trafficking everywhere. <laughs> uh, very dangerous. I didn't actually get that preview. The only preview note that I have is that the Top Gun 2 preview said coming December 2020 at the end. And I'm like, that was lazy. <laughs> they worked the volleyball back in. I, yeah, I, I'm that looking was nice. forward to Top Gun. Yeah. I'm looking forward to Top Gun. So, okay. So we opened the movie proper on Marky Mark dancing around and singing Elvis songs. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I, I, I wrote my notes, kids singing. Wow, I missed that blaring error sound already. Right. And then we get Mel Gibson. Yes. Yeah, he's watching a kid dance around in his underwear, both in the movie and probably in real life. We don't know. But. <laughs> and he's, of course, cussing a lot and smoking cigarettes in a tiny enclosed room with this kid. Yeah. This is a cold open to the movie is a kid in underwear and then a cigarette and then a PBR can. And then we see Mel Gibson is in the same room. Yep. It's, it's a very upsetting open to a movie. In that <laughs> order. Yeah, exactly. And then we cut to, and this is baby Marky Mark, I guess, and we're getting the message that his dad wasn't a very good dad. He said the F word in front of him, even when he was a baby. But then we get Marky Mark all grown up, and he's getting psyched up for a boxing match. Yeah. And don't worry, this boxing match is going to matter. No, it won't. None of it will nope. matter. <laughs> no, and it's a whole montage of boxing matches. We get like seven of them here. Yeah. It says based on a true story, and I'm like, yeah, but not an interesting one. It's... <laughs> Not, nothing <laughs> happens. I got that when nothing happened in it. Yeah, I was like, how, how could this not be a true story? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Do you think this was just like the random thoughts of Mel Gibson? I'm thinking about it. So they transitioned from the kid dancing around in underwear, and then, it, then it's Marky Mark in his underwear, boxing a locker, like punching a wall a bunch and getting all excited. It just seems like Mel Gibson saying things he thought of, and they made it into the first two scenes of the movie, maybe? Sure. I don't know. Oh, they just let Mel narrate the first three shots of the film. Yeah. <laughs> so now, eventually, though, the, the boxing montage resolves with Marky Mark at a doctor's office waiting on his brain x-ray results or something. Yeah. And this was like a red herring, because like, again, I watched the preview. I knew that like a lot of this movie is going to be about Marky Mark being injured or sick or something, but this was like a red herring to that injury slash yes. sickness. Right. It was like they were teasing. They were like, oh, are we getting the plot started already? No, no. <laughs> You've got an hour and a half for that, <laughs> folks. So this is where we meet his mom. But more importantly, this is also where we meet Marky Mark's selective attempt at an accent. <laughs> yes. What accent is this? It's confusing. It could equally be Brooklyn or Scotland. I have no fucking clue. Mm -hmm. It felt like Cajun, but fast, like fast Cajun. <laughs> fast that? Yes. Cajun. Sure. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And so the Dodger comes in and he's telling him that he's got a medical issue that's not going to allow him to box. And it's this is based on a true story that he went with the real condition. So it's weird. It makes no sense. It takes a long time for them to explain it. And I'm like, writers, this is one of the times where you just lie, right? You just say, <laughs> oh, you know, you have a weak something in your brain and it's going to fucking collapse. You don't have to give us this long convoluted explanation. This is yeah. when you write. You, yes. you write whatever you want, man. <laughs> it's just based on a true story. You don't have to transcribe it, writers. Right. So, but the doctor explains he can't box for a living anymore. And I'm just like, well, he wasn't boxing for a living anyway, right? So, right. but the doctor leaves and his mom starts talking, trying to talk him into getting some normal job kind of job. Yeah, at one point she's like, what about oil rigs? I hear those pay well. And he's like, that was two movies ago, mom. God, keep up. <laughs> you tell me to buy a zoo next? Well, yeah, and he says in the movie, he's like, I don't have any skills. I couldn't do a normal job. And I'm like, this is a movie about you becoming a priest, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. But then we cut to him at a cemetery drinking over his dead brother's grave. Yes. This dead, the, his brother died when he was like seven or eight years old. And this dead brother will be the entirety of his family dynamic. Also, can I just say that, like, my older brother died when I was an infant and he was a toddler is a weird oeuvre to give your main character. Yeah. Right. Like, if it's a parent, I get it. Or a best friend who died in a in a plane accident. Sorry, I got Top Gun on the brain. But like that I get. But the fact that he's like, oh, 
I barely remember those 48 seconds we spent together, yeah. but this is my main driving force. Oh, and also, because of the accent, I have no idea what he's saying here. Yep. Right, like I wrote in my notes, is I feel like he's challenging the corpse to snatch those chiclets from his hand. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what happened, right? Okay, yep. all right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's like, see if you can fucking get him, and then they move on. Like, that didn't just happen. Like, he didn't just look at a grave and try to do the thing with the snatch from the hand <laughs> what happened there Heath I expect you to do this speech word for word at my grave when my heart explodes by the way so. okay no this is <laughs> hope you were taking notes okay make sure it's in the will <laughs> and then he's all drunk and shit so he gets up and there's this Jesus statue on some grave and he starts trying to like challenge it to a fight he doesn't flinch yeah he tries to flinch a Jesus statue and then I wrote in my notes he's not gonna punch that statue is he and then he punches the statue. <laughs> and then the cops show up within seconds, like they had a sensor on like all they had the a Jesus fake statues. Out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Somebody's been punching those Jesus statues. I bet it's this guy. <laughs> Neighborhood kids. Oh, no, it's an adult. It's a wow. It's a grown up. Okay. He turns around so fast. He's like, I wasn't punching Jesus. I wasn't punching Jesus. <laughs> I will say the elderly couple that was with me did not appreciate this sight gag at all. Yeah, my my church didn't like it either. They were not fans. Gasps. Yeah. Punch him back. No, they don't. It's, it's a statue. <laughs> and I proudly stand. It. Stop it. Come on. <laughs> so, yeah. So the next morning we get him getting out of jail. Now, I should say this movie sells itself as like this guy went from being an ex-con to being a priest. That's how the, the movie poster is designed and everything. But like all his ex-con shit turns out to be like, drunken statue punching that doesn't count right yeah i imagine there was a boardroom meeting where they tried to pitch piece of shit tries to become something but dies first and they went with ex-con okay yeah no that's fair that's fair but yeah so his mom picks him up and she's like have you thought any more about the job and he's like yes i have i've come up with the stupidest possible solution here (laughs) he's gonna be an actor in hollywood he's gonna go to hollywood Ah, and mom's like, you can't act. That's a terrible idea. And I just kept writing in my notes. This is very meta for her to be saying to Marky Mark. (laughs) She she also says at one point, she says, all the actors are a bunch of hippie commies. And I just I want to point out at this point that it was Mel Gibson's girlfriend who wrote this script. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I believe so. My theater loved that line, by the way. Yeah, loved it. Didn't they? So, and of course, they establish at this point that his estranged father, Mel Gibson, lives out near Hollywood. I wonder if he'll run into him. So we cut to Mel Gibson. We have to meet him in L.A. traffic, angrily calling the how's my driving line. Yeah, he is. uh, And by the way, I just want to say, if anyone calls the how's my driving line, it's Mel Gibson. Not Mel Gibson's (laughs) character, Mel Gibson. (laughs) At one point, he's like on the phone and he's swearing into the phone. He's using the R slur and stuff. And he turns and there's a kid in the other car watching him. And I wrote in my notes, oh, Mel Gibson's going to ask that kid if he's Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's on the cutting room floor. You know it is. It's there <laughs> Absolutely. somewhere. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, but that's our introduction to Mel Gibson in the modern day. And then we cut to Marky Mark making it to Hollywood. There's this part where he's charming the desk clerk at the hotel that he's going to stay at. Oh, God. Yeah. And it's this like it's like the whole if I answer fast enough, it must be witty thing. There's a lot of that in this movie. Sure is. There's a lot of like banter in terms of standing very close to the table while playing ping pong. (laughs) Right. Yeah. But yeah, so he checks into his hotel room. Give you an idea how boring this fucking movie is going to be. I think there's like about 45 seconds at this point of Marky Mark just hopping around going, woohoo, hotel room. Right. Yeah, which means at some point this guy was talking to the writers and he was like, and you got to you got to remember to say how excited I was to be in a day's in. (laughs) (laughs) That's vital to my story and my journey. I get excited, though. I mean, even a shitty hotel room, you know, you you like jump on the bed a little bit, order order pizza for yourself if you want. You can do that at home. See, now I'm planning for the for the biopic of you. Yeah. I'm already. It's called Home Alone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so then we cut to him getting a job slicing meat at a supermarket. Yeah. Am I wrong here? Or did he get the job at the supermarket 
so that he could schmooze his way into Hollywood via the meat counter? That yes. was his move. Yeah, that was that was a strategy. Yes. Yeah, in the movie's, I believe, third montage at this point, we get the bit where he's asking all of his customers, hey, are you? do you work in Hollywood? You are a uh, Hollywood person? Yeah. In fairness, I had this job. I, I was a meat slicer at a deli counter, and I used it to make it as a podcaster. So, oh, well, like, there you whoa. go. You know, <laughs> stepping stone. I thought it was weird when you traded me a pound of turkey for your job on this show. And I got to say, it's worked out. Yeah, well, it's absolutely worked out. So, oh, and then we get the bit where he's auditioning and the guy's like, if you blow me, I'll give you a part. And then he doesn't he doesn't blow the guy or or get the part. He's going to beat him up. Yes. Because gay hate crime. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, my audience loved that. They yes. were like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at this. Too. he's beating up the gay guy classic. So, <laughs> nice. I actually got to watch my audience because this is the same audience that was burned by Tammy Faye. They're fragile. Um, I got to watch my audience be worried he was going to suck a dick <laughs> and then be like, yeah. yay, hate crimes. All right. All right. Close one. Woo. Now beat up a Chinese guy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Quack. Quack. Is Quack. <laughs> All right, so then we cut to him in a bar, drinking away his disappointment at, at not having made it in Hollywood yet. Mm -hmm. This is when I wrote in my notes for the first time, wow, this movie hasn't realized that, and then nothing in particular happened, can't carry the first hour of a film. It will never learn that, by the way. S spoiler alert, it can't carry the first 90 minutes of a film either. Right. No, this This scene is just, he goes to a bar, and then in real life, Marky Mark got into a fight at that bar, so they kept a little bit of that, and then they were like, all right, cut. <laughs> I don't know. That was nothing. Heath brings up a strong argument that this movie could have been two documentary crews trying to make a movie about Mel Gibson. I'm and Marty 90% Mark, certain. Respectively. <laughs> and they were just like, ah, we didn't get enough footage. Or did we? We did two, right? <laughs> you guys were doing one? Nice. Oh, uh, yeah. Nothing at all happens at that bar. So we go from there to him back at work slicing meat at the counter. And he starts flirting with this customer that walks by. Yeah, I wrote in my notes, dude, don't do that. And then the customer is like, dude, don't do that. And then his boss is like, dude, don't do that. And I'm like, good movie. Thank you. Yeah. Well, no, because the movie's like, he's too romantic to hear no when yep. it's said to him. <laughs> yeah, right. The whole fucking romantic stalking of, of Hollywood here. And to be clear, it's not your typical like romantic comedy stalking, which is like problematic in retrospect. This is just this is problematic for the time. This movie's set in like 1972, and she's like, "Hey, man, you're creeping me out. I'm gonna go hang out with JFK and Nixon, where I'll feel more sexually safe." <laughs> so she essentially runs away from him. He chases her down, but he's too late. And he says to the cashier, "Hey, did you see that female lead come through here?" She's like, "Sure did." She pinned up an advertisement for her church on the bulletin board. So I bet you could stalk her to there. Yeah romantically yeah well right stuck. yeah exactly yeah. he literally says that he's like i thought this used to be called romance and everybody's like no it's no, stalking it's, you're you were gonna chase a lady into the parking lot i had to stop <laughs> you just moments ago i'm sure that that's how stalkers justified it then sure yeah. but uh this pepper spray is from loving too much <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i should point out too at this point so i I don't know how they didn't know this was coming, seeing as how the movie was called Father Stew and not like Pastor Stew. But this was the first time I think that the elderly couple in front of me realized that this was going to be about Catholics, not real Christians. Oh. Yeah, that got worse and worse as we went. Did they walk out? No, but uh, they got really uncomfortable eventually. <laughs> Such a stupid distinction. <laughs> so he stalks Carmen to her church. I wrote my notes here. I was like, I can't tell if it's creeper that she stalked him there or that there is a Catholic church, but it's creepy yeah. one way or the other. There's nothing good about this character. It's not compelling in any way. And it gets yes. worse from here. I, I kept turning to Anna and being like, they're hitting all the movie beats of something happens to a character we like. Yeah. But they forgot to ever make us like They forgot to character. redeem it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So he goes into the church and we have that like. You know how they always all have, like have like the the person who doesn't know how to Christianity yet has to say grace or whatever in the in the movies. So we get that, but it's at, at like mass or whatever. So we have to have him like not being good at sitting down in a pew when everyone else does. Right? Yeah. So fucking dumb. It's also I want to point out 
a Catholic mass is fucking insane if you've never been to it before. Yeah. So it doesn't quite work. Like, we've watched a lot of David R. A. R. White movies where, like, I don't know how to say grace. And, like, okay, I get it. But, like, when someone's walking down the aisle with a silver decanter full of smoke that represents the Pope's all-seeing connection to the spider god underneath the <laughs> citadel, I understand why a character might be like, I don't understand how this ceremony works. Well, and if they were willing to make fun of Catholicism a little bit, they could point out that he has to stand up, lean, kneel, fucking sit down like a goddamn comedy sketch through this entire thing, right? Yeah, Catholicism is the original bop it, and I refuse to be told otherwise. <laughs> so, okay. So then they go to the church cafeteria, I guess, for some lunch. This is where we meet his, uh, some of his best friends are black ham. <laughs> okay. So here's what's great about this scene with ham. He roasts ham. He's like, ham, your name's ham. But like, he spends way too long doing it for him and that character to be friends for the rest of the movie. It's just like an indeterminate amount of time being like, ham, fucking ham. Stupid. So stupid. What's your brother's name? Cheese? Or you your name is I don't stupid. Get yeah. Yeah. There's also this weird moment where he's like, so, so there's this girl that I, and Ham's like, you mean Carmen? Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. He, he, he's like, yep, it's Carmen. She's apparently the only good looking Catholic in LA. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I felt like Ham was going to offer to sell him some of her used dryer sheets or something. Yeah, it was pretty freaky. That's no, don't do that. Like, so if some guy shows up at whatever your place is, your church even, is like, I, I have this flyer I'm using to stalk a lady. Carmen, it's Carmen right there. Don't help with that. No. Don't yeah. <laughs> say who Carmen is and point her out. The only people who you should respond to when they say, have you seen this woman, is a search party. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you are just initiating an eventual search party. And even if it's a search party, like, do a little homework first. You're right. Exactly. Yeah, who's searching? Yeah. I want a woman and a child to be part of that search party. Otherwise, they're not getting shit out of me. <laughs> so, yeah. So but then Carmen shows up and she's like, hey, you want to go into the other room or should I yell at you in front of all these people? And he's like, we can go into the other yeah, <laughs> and you know of course she's telling him hey could you like leave me alone and he's like nope I sure can't it's so romantic I just won't take no for an answer yeah and I'm like you, you guys know that at a certain point that's just rape right you do know well it is a Catholic movie so yeah. I'm not sure how much they do know this and again like Look, we've seen this even in mainstream movies, not just Christian movies. The like, I won't take no for an answer is romanticism, except the characters in the movie aren't charmed by it in this case. So everyone's just like, Carmen, are you OK? Do you want us to have him escorted out by the cops? Yes. Meet cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's also this great part where Carmen's like, well, you know, I'm Christian. So even if we were dating, I wouldn't fuck you. And Stu's like. I can pretend to be okay with that and try to talk you out of it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. This didn't have to be. I, I want to throw this out there. I don't think this had to be part of Father Stu's biopic, <laughs> right? I don't think you needed to insist on and, and make sure everybody knows that I really didn't want to be a Catholic. I really just wanted to fuck this woman I had never met before. Right. <laughs> I was being walked out of a church because of a restraining order. And then I bumped into this lady and all her books fell. And it was, <laughs> it was really cute. So, yeah. So then he's he's back in his hotel room. He calls his mom, tells him that he's got his big break. He's going to be on TV tomorrow. But it's for a mop commercial. Mom is very disappointed. <laughs> I know the movie is trying to use that as a failure beat. But if you got a national commercial, that would be fucking amazing. That'd be pretty good for your first yeah. like week and a half in Hollywood. Yeah. And it's a funny mop commercial. I laughed at the mop commercial. I it was pretty it. good. Yeah, it was a good mop commercial. And then we get a, what I have in my notes is a nothing in particular montage. <laughs> it really is. It was a Heath eating alone in his apartment. It was a home alone Heath. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. You can say what you know it was. Yeah. Right. And this is another way of saying nothing in particular. Yeah. yeah. My notes are very uh, careful at this point about the movie. I'm like, hey, eating steak in your underpants seems like a lifestyle choice. <laughs> it's the dream. For, that's how you know you made it. probably right for some people. Yeah. Every morning I say to myself, nailing it while I do that. <laughs> and by the way, he's eating. The, he makes the steak in the pan and then he eats it right out of the pan. And that there's two advantages to that. First of all, obviously <laughs> keeps it warm, mm -hmm. but also saves a lot of time. You're not washing you the dishes now. You don't have now. to do dishes now. Yeah. Jeez. Why are you adding a plate to the mix? <laughs> like an idiot. Podcast listener, you just heard the first sentence of that, but Heath actually did three and a half minutes of defense <laughs> and he take out of a plate. <laughs> It'll probably get cut in the final. Don't, we don't need to like look at the everything. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, 
So at, we get this aggressively boring, and then eventually he got an apartment and made himself some underwear steak or whatever. I see. I just I made it sound so much more interesting than it was. Yeah. <laughs> and that cuts to him like he's drunk driving at some point. I guess it's his, the anniversary of his brother's death or it's his brother's birthday or something. It always has to come back to the brother. So that's why he's drunk driving when he gets pulled over and harassed by a cop. Yeah, you can tell Mel Gibson had a hand in this part of the script. <laughs> this is very much a rewrite of Mel's incident, shall we say. Yeah, those L.A. cops always harassing the whites. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll tell you what, the plot isn't going to kick in for another 45 minutes at least, so we're just going to wing it on where the acts start and, and, and stop. So that means we get to take a break, but we're back in a hurry with even more Father Stew. Does the plot kick in? Yeah, it's like an hour and 38 minutes. <laughs> All right, let me know when that happens. I will do. I, yeah, I, I got it in that. my notes. I've okay. got these signals. Oh, bro, Mel Gibson. I'm so excited to work with you, bro. Hey, you too, Sparky Marge. Oh, uh, you could just call me Mock, Mr. Oh, Gibson. Like like in the Bible. Yeah, Mr. Gibson, like, like in the fucking Bible. Oh, you know who's in the Bible? Who's that, Mr. Gibson? Fucking Jews. Uh, yeah, 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 they are. Hey, did you know that my father is like a prominent Holocaust denier? Like prominent. Just yeah, no, I am right aware of that. There. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, so it's time to start the scene where Mel yells at a vending machine very angrily and Mark starts a fight with someone for no reason. You ready for that? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, hey, Mel? Yeah, Bart? Do you worry that this script is just the worst parts about us as people put on a movie screen? Yeah, and action. Fucking Jewish vending machine. I'm going to beat you up and serve minimal consequences, bro. <laughs> careful, careful. Yelling careful doesn't make it easier. Just hey, be guys. careful. Guys, what's, uh, what's going on with this balance beam? Oh, hey, Noah. I'm trying to walk that very thin line of properly taking care of my physical health. Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, how so? Well, you see, one side, you have like negative body image, unrealistic expectations, and the general philosophy that anyone who isn't like a fitness model is somehow a failure. Right. But on this side is the total dismissal of physical fitness entirely as something smart people don't have to do that's completely disconnected from the mind. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on that side. Well, that seems like a tricky line to walk. Why, why don't you just try FitBod? Oh, what's FitBod? No matter your goals or experience level, FitBod finds your next best workout. No six-week plans, no shortcuts, no bullshit. FitBod's innovative algorithm learns your goals and experience level, then crafts a personalized training regimen unique to you. So wait, it's an app that plans your workouts for you? That's right. FitBot's one-of-a-kind algorithm uses data to create a dynamic fitness plan just for you based on your personal goals, equipment, fitness level, and workout history. Access your personalized routine on the easy-to-use mobile app and start making progress on your goals wherever you are. It's like having 24-7 access to a personal trainer. It's true. I started using FitBot when they became a sponsor, and I love that I can adjust what I'm working out with or how long I want to work out for and even the intensity of the workout with just a couple taps of a button. All right, Noah, I'm sold. How do I sign up? Build your fitness habit and become a better version of yourself with FitBod. Get 25% off your subscription or try out the new app for free when you sign up now at FitBod.me slash GAM. That's 25% off your subscription when you sign up today at FitBod.me slash GAM. Nice, thanks. Say, what do you get if you make it to the end of the line anyway? Oh, you get to pick up your grandkids without screaming. Oh, that tracks. And we're back for more of this shit. When we last left off, our hero was getting his car impounded for drunk driving again. So we're going to rejoin the action with him kind of half acidly trying to steal his dad's truck. This is a documentary of these people in real life. It's 100%. 100% what's happening. Maybe Mel Gibson is really Marky Mark's dad. Okay. Ooh, All right. Explains a lot. Weren't they together in the, these two roles in a different movie also as dad and son? Possibly. I don't. Not that I recall. I think they were. Yes. We bought a zoo. Do you ever see them together in the same room? That doesn't make sense. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is real. Yeah. So so he goes to this like construction site where his dad works and he's like, I'm going to steal this truck. And everybody's like, that's Bill's truck. You can't have it. And he's like, I'm going to steal it. And they're like, you don't have the 
keys though so it doesn't you, like there's no he's like okay well i'm gonna sit in here and whine it about it my daddy issues in it and they're like well i guess we can't stop you from doing yeah, that legally i'm gonna <laughs> hot wire it now you're just you're just fiddling around with your hands or you're not that's yes. not that's nothing nothing's gonna happen there what's amazing <laughs> is i think marky mark was like my characters can usually hot wire cars right i'll just reach under the <laughs> <laughs> oh no the script says i don't do that oh. damn <laughs> But yeah, then finally Mel Gibson comes over and they're supposed to have like a sassy back and forth, but it's just like two poisonous assholes yelling at each other. Yep. Right. It's supposed to be like, ah, what kind of father are you? What kind of son? But it's just like, eh, fuck you. No, fuck you. Fuck you. No, fuck you. Mumble, grumble. Have you been, uh, are cameras following you around recently? Because it feels like that <laughs> me, I'm getting a lot of, uh, it doesn't matter. Fuck you. Right. And, and, and of course, nothing comes of this because it's a scene in this fucking movie so then we cut to Carmen finishing up her Sunday school teaching thing and, and Marky Mark shows up to harass her some more. Mm -hmm. This is when she tells him that she won't date him unless he gets baptized as a Catholic. And he's like, yeah, of course. Sure. He's, he's so happy to be baptized. She's like, you'd have to get baptized. He's like, yeah, it's all bullshit. Why not? Go ahead. Dunk me. Right. Yeah. I'll be a Muslim too. Whatever you want. Yeah. I'll go swimming and then we fuck. Great. <laughs> And by the way, the, like, I should point out there, because this is really insidious, the way that it's usually done. There is a very strong use your vagina for the glory of Christ messaging that's being sent to women here that like, you know, very strong. Yeah, yes. Throughout this movie, I thought we should acknowledge. So, yeah, fucking gross. But apparently that was enough because now he and Carmen are dating. We, we cut to them at a karaoke bar singing off key. Yeah, you know, you know, it's fun. I, I love to watch karaoke in a movie. It's yeah. already like <laughs> the worst thing you can watch and then um, nothing. Yeah, no. it's barely standable when it's people you like, let alone fictional characters you don't. Yeah. Well, and also let's point out that this is the third time in the movie that we've paused for a little off key singing, right? Because we yeah. had him cooking as a kid and as an adult. This is the karaoke of movies. Like that's <laughs> the, yeah. the art form that they went with is karaoke cinema. Next time I get drunk, I'm just going to like drag everybody to this movie. Come on. It's going to be fun. I'll do it first. I'll watch the movie first. So, also, in this scene, he appears to be trying to karaoke her into consent because they're singing a love song. Yes. Right. Like he's like, you got to read the words on the screen. And she's like, it's OK to have sex with me, Marky Mark. Sign on the dotted line. And she's like, you know, none of this works. Right. And he's like, I don't know. It's the 70s. <sighs> So, okay, so then we cut to him at, at Sunday school. It's Ash Wednesday. They always have the silly little smudge on their heads, and they're talking about what they're going to give up. Now, they go for the kindergarten cop, you know, boys have a penis, girls have a vagina joke with one of the kids, right? The, the one kid goes, my dad said he's going to give up porn for, for Lent. And everybody tees, and I'm like, hey, Catholics, bring it in. Don't have children <laughs> make sex jokes in your movies for at least the next yeah. century. Forever? Yeah. For ballpark yeah. ever would be great. Yeah. Right. Like, so if Arnold Schwarzenegger had a bunch of allegations of touching children inappropriately, that kindergarten cop bit wouldn't work. No. Right. Yeah. They didn't have Arnold do like a self breast exam for a bunch of <laughs> cleaning workers in that movie. <laughs> Yeah, but instead, Marky Mark gets into an argument with that child about whether or not porn is sex. Okay, yeah. Again, this is a documentary. 100% Marky Mark is like, <laughs> what? I said, I think give up sex and give up porn on the same day. He said it. He said porn first. He starts yelling at this child. It was very convincing. Well, right. And again, this is supposed to be this like, oh, he sure is bad at Christianity at this point in his character arc. But he wants to fight a kid. <laughs> right, like bad at Christianity and wanting to fight a kid should be taken in two very distinct ways. <laughs> yeah, well, I, here's what I think it is. We're so used to the trope of like being bad at Christianity, good at Christianity, but this is bad at Catholicism, good at Catholicism, and the end result of being good at Catholicism is waving the giant silver chalice for the spider god. So they've got to start as, <laughs> yeah. they're like, oh yeah, no, when you're a bad Catholic, you want to fist fight a child and you drive drunk. <laughs> And so, okay, so now he and Carmen are at a at a fucking bar more. Yeah. He brings up the problem of evil vis-a-vis -vis his dead brother to her, right? How can God be good if he killed my little brother when we were kids? This might be the worst problem of evil apologetic we've had in a movie. So, so I don't even remember what she said because it was so stupid, but I, I wrote in my notes, like, the key to answering this question is, you you act like the answer to it is super simple, but then you're so fucking vague 
that no one can tell if you've answered the question at all? Yeah. Well, I mean, the joke we used to make about Problem of Evil is jingly keys, and she literally hands him jingly beads. Right? She does. Like, here, <laughs> here you go. Yep. He starts batting them around like a cat. Yeah. <laughs> ah, this isn't so bad. Yeah, and so, and then we get this, uh, another fucking montage of him, like, learning to Jesus better. Oh, God. But so here's the thing, though, is that all their stuff is simplistic and stupid, but they have to make it seem complicated. So it's like watching the getting better at archery montage with their target is literally the broadside of a bar. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, is this the, where they have that little meeting, that, like, church? Yes, yeah. Uh -huh. thing? Is that a real, like, do churches have these terrifying little meetings where like six of you sit on tiny little chairs for kids <laughs> and then a pastor as a power move in a grown-up chair tells you about the bible as a like a little focus group i can't speak to the chair size but yes that's uh the, they definitely yeah, do that communion class god that's nightmare and again same thing right because the priest gives him a bunch of latin words and obtuse terminology but with the message that the priest is sending him underneath all of that is just do better as a human. Yep. Just be a better human. Could you suck a little less? We'd like you to be sympathetic before Act Three. Right. <laughs> he will not. Or midway through would yeah. be fine. I was about to say he's not going to hit the pace. You just yeah. Suggest. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but then so okay, so now he's ready to get baptized. He's he's going off for baptism. He can't tie a tie at all, though. He didn't know how. He calls his mom, tells him that he's going to get baptized for some chick. I want to give credit where credit's due to this film. Mom, who you always expect to be like, I'm so proud of you, baby. You finally found Jeebus. At every point of this movie when he's like, hey, mom, I'm doing some Christian shit. She's like, that sounds boring and stupid. Bye. <laughs> yeah. yes. The mom's excellent. For the entire film till he literally dies. Yep. No, the mom was the only sympathetic character in the whole fucking movie for me. Yeah. So, yeah, so, but he calls mom. She's not very proud of him. And then he goes to get baptized. <laughs> Carmen is very impressed with how immersed in water part of his head is. Okay, thank you. Because I, I was like, are they going for a cheesecake shot here? And they definitely are. Yes. Yeah, he takes the shirt off. He pops the shirt in real life. And they're like, all right, fine. Okay. Oh, damn it. <laughs> we'll let it go. And they use it. Marky Mark starts to slowly slide his pants down his legs. No, Cut. Mark. <laughs> Cut. So you, you, they just do the like pour over his head with like, yeah. you know, a pitcher thing. But, you know, you know, that video of like the, the Russian Orthodox priest, like killing a baby. <laughs> yeah, yes. that's all I wanted this whole time. Yeah. All I want. Marky Mark's not that big of a guy. He's a small guy. Right. I feel like a big Russian Orthodox priest could have been picking this guy up and just like slamming him over and over yeah. into a big thing of water. There's like a normal priest doing it. And then Marky Mark gets up there and the undertaker rises yes. from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so but no instead we just get fucking a pitcher of water dumped over the back of his head or something so then we get the scene where he meets carmen's parents don't worry we will literally never see these characters again no no they do have this weird sex moment though where the dad's like I want you to know that I need you to treat my daughter like the statue of Virgin Mary. And I wrote in my notes, got it. Punch her while he's strong. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> he's established a pattern. No. <laughs> yeah, I guess what we're supposed to learn here is that he's taking it real seriously because he learned to say grace in Spanish for these motherfuckers. Mm hmm And then dad misogynates a little bit about, you know, his daughter and, and how he owns her and, and won't give her up cheap i guess yeah he says he says i need you to crawl on your hands and knees to my daughter right apparently people do that with the statue he was talking about and you can Ooh. see mark mark being like okay crawl hands knees mouth stuff good tip okay got it <laughs> got it so, uh, is that what you're saying so and then we get his first confession and of course he just he doesn't know how to confess he's talking far too loud yep He's not taking it very seriously at all. I'm an atheist. What is this bench church bench thing? Do I sit? How does it? <laughs> so, so confusing. All right. So so now he's back at a bar yet again where one out of every three of uh, scenes in this movie take place. And there's a mysterious guy at the bar saying the kind of pseudo intellectual crap that people dumb enough to get roped in by Catholicism think is <laughs> profound. Methy, Jesus. Methy, Jesus. <laughs> 
That's correct. Meth Jesus is in like you, you go to a bar and a stranger starts halfway through a crazy speech into your ear from really close. You go away. Yeah. But Mark yep. Yorts, like on board right away. He's like, oh, this sounds like an interesting conversation with this guy. I'm going to get in there. Yeah, and he talks for a while. Because this movie is about the guy who's having that conversation at the bar. Well, right. Yeah. Written by the people who have that conversation at the bar. Right. Like, keep in mind that this is a guy who almost at one point in this movie got into a fight with a mounted deer head at a bar. Mm-hmm. Right. Almost got into a fight with a Jesus <laughs> statue at one point when he was drunk. And apparently fucking meth angel Jesus or whatever can show up and start roasting him. And he's like, oh, no, that's pretty good. You nailed me. You got me. Right, but it, it's so unsubtle. Like, he just keeps hinting at the rest of the plot of the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And then, of course, he, he ends the whole thing by going, now, whatever you do, don't go drunk driving and get yourself into an accident. <laughs> and and Marky Mark's like, what? And Meth Jesus is like, what? Yeah. What? It's, it's, <laughs> what did you say? He's so clearly trying to be like, no, God damn it! I am Jesus Christ, and I'm trying to give you a lesson. <laughs> Nazareth. And Marky Mark's just like dumber and dumber, missing it. The guy's like s- getting up on a ladder. I'm on a cross now. Do you see this? <laughs> oh uh, no! He's okay. Pours he's some water out on the floor. Starts to walk back and forth on it. Huh? <laughs> huh? The ice skating? No. What? No, I'm gonna I'm go not, do more meth in the bathroom. Th- it's water. <laughs> Jesus, me. <laughs> yeah. So, but he, but. Damn it, if he doesn't go drunk driving, get himself into the most amazing accident I have ever seen. <laughs> I got in trouble with my theater. I always get in trouble. Every time I'm like, I'm not going to get in trouble with my theater. But I couldn't. The second impact was too much for the me. The second okay. one was way too. I got in trouble so, on the second one. If I recall correctly, he's uh, somebody pulls out in front of him. He's on a motorcycle. So he swerves out in front of this guy, hits another guy, flies off of his motorcycle into another truck, <laughs> falls onto the ground, and then gets run over. Yeah, He slides He slides so far when he gets shot off. <laughs> <laughs> right, and they very clearly put, like, one of those boxing dummies with the mean face on, on a highway and ran it over with Ted Subaru because the head does, like, a... <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> it's pretty good. Like that game shuffleboard, like a puck. It looks like that, yeah. and then it's but it's Marky Mark, and then he gets murdered by a truck. Yeah, so I good. expected the Grand Theft Auto wasted show up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so so he gets hit by seventeen cars, and he's laying there half dead on the road. When suddenly the Virgin Mary shows up to tell him that everything's gonna be okay, and then an anvil lands on him. She's like, "Oh, we're good, we're good. Oh. It's it's enough now. I'm doing my thing." Uh, it's my me now. Sorry, that that was Joseph. He's very jealous. <laughs> yeah, but so, and then half dead, he starts roasting Virgin Mary. Yeah. He's like, oh, you're the Virgin Mary. Tell your son I said, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> also, why is the Virgin Mary white? And she's that, <laughs> just, I just, I'm always surprised. Why I, is look, Jesus to, white? Yeah, I yeah. mean, like, I'm always used to white Jesus at this point, but I am always taken aback when there's just like very clearly a girl from Minnesota being like, "It's me, the Virgin fucking Mary, bro. Here I am." Okay, good chance they tried to have Jesus not be white, and it didn't work out in the scene with Marky Mark at the bar. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah. Like, All right, we have to get. Mel white Gibson Jesus. got him on his way out to the car. Sure, yeah, no, yeah, it makes right. we're cutting so much of this just for slurs. It's. <laughs> We're gonna have to combine with Mel Gibson's talk to get two hours. All right, so so now we got Stu. He's comatose in a hospital. Mom's there. The doc is like, "Hey, you know your your son's probably gonna die." And she's like, "No, no, no. My other son already died. That's my entire personality. This would be you. You can't have. Bo- Doesn't it seem like she's saying you can't have both kids die? That's the rule. Yeah. yeah. She almost says it. She's like, lightning never strikes twice. And like, so I already you, God killed one of my kids. That it's impossible." to do another one. That's what she said. Right, and the doctor's like, no, 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 lightning doesn't strike the same place twice as the saying, you dumb fucking idiot. <laughs> and also it does sometimes. No, there's only ever been one lightning strike ever. <laughs> Read a book. And then the doctor's like, oh, you know, we could re- recommend a good grief counselor for you because, you know, the doctor doesn't know the awesome power of God yet. Yeah. This is a Christian movie, Bingo Square, we are sorely in need of. The doctor who's just doing their job and the other person retelling the story as the doctor being like, let me tell you that's one dead son. Do you mind if I eat him before he gets cold? <laughs> <laughs> you gonna finish that son? 
Yeah, so Carmen shows up. She's got a Bible and a rosary. Mom, for her part, roasts the Bible and all the bullshit prayer stuff. Again, I don't know how I secretly snuck into the writer's room because this is very clearly supposed to be the moment where mom is like won over by Jesus. But instead, mom's like, oh, um, you like the Virgin Mary. Could you tell the Virgin Mary to eat my ass? Could she eat my whole ass? <laughs> Yeah, but of course, stupid fucking movie. Pretty much the second the Bible touches Stu's hand, he wakes up from his coma. Yeah. Right. Because Jesus. Yeah, right. Because Jesus is in that book. And of course, elsewhere in the hospital, we get Mel Gibson yelling at a vending machine. Yeah. I wrote my notes at this point. I just I don't like the way that angry atheists are being portrayed in this film. I, I was going to say, <laughs> I became careful in my notes here as I was careful in my notes about... Eating steak in your underwear. Sometimes the fucking vending machine doesn't give you the goddamn candy bar, though. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're all agreeing steak in your underwear and throwing a vending machine to the ground. Yeah, Jews started all the vending machines. <laughs> this is another real life thing with Mel Gibson, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, but then they wheel Stu out. Um, he's out of his coma, and Mel Gibson seems apparently disappointed that he's not deader. He's like, Jesus, I came all the way down here, and you're not even still in a fucking coma. Fuck you. Yeah. So, and this is also where Mel meets Carmen for the first time and finds out that his son is Catholic for the first time. It's so good. <laughs> he, she's like, ah, oh, he is Catholic now. And he's like, no, he's an atheist. And Marky Mark might as well be doing the like cut gesture under his chin <laughs> behind her. <laughs> nope. Dad, remember I love genus. Jesus? Gene, Gene. <laughs> Should have written it down. Don't ock play cock all right, yeah, so, so, but Marky Marcus, he recovers fully, so he gets out of the hospital. He's wandering around and crushes. He goes back to the bar where he met that mysterious meth Jesus, right? <laughs> How, hey, was I drinking with Jesus Christ of Nazareth the other <laughs> night? And the bartender's like, I don't know, man. Oh, this is so bad. I expected the bartender to be like, that meth Jesus died 20 years ago this very night. Or something. This is so dumb. Is this your sweater? <laughs> he hasn't been here in 2,000 years. <laughs> so, yeah. So he goes to Carmen and he's like, yeah, I just, you know, I don't get it. More problem of evil stuff. And she's like, you know what? Uh, I, I, I don't, I've run out of apologetics. How about we fuck instead? Yeah. Okay. I think this is the first ever, like, Pity problem of evil fuck I've seen in the movie. <laughs> That's interesting. I found this interesting. And can I just say, we are 349 Christian movies in. This is the only acceptable answer to the problem of evil we've ever had in a film. <laughs> yeah. I'm sold. If William Lane Craig just sort of gently starts to run his finger down my lips into my <laughs> chest, <laughs> if we're ever in a debate, Kalam I'm fucking sold. Cosmo <laughs> he, did, he did win. <laughs> I just want to point out one thing, though. Before she fucks him, she says, you're probably wondering why this happened. And I wrote in my notes, he drove drunk for the fourth time that we've seen in this movie. Right. I don't really think that counts as problem of evil. <laughs> problem of evil is like eyeball cancer and hurricanes, not like... Why would it be three strikes and you're out? I'm in jail. <laughs> So, yeah, so but so he he has sex with Carmen, but then he has to go to confession, right? Because he's all nervous that God's going to be mad at him. And he tries to be coy with the priest. He's like, you know, I had X, say, with an 80 lay, you know. Yeah, the, the priest explains to him the confidentiality thing. He's like, oh, oh, dude, don't worry. I, I can't tell anybody what you say. Trust me, I am covering up so many child rapes right yeah. now. Like, your, your <gasps> consensual sex is not even a thing. Don't worry about it, my guy. <laughs> and... This is also where the priest kind of suggests that maybe God has plans for Stu that'll eventually kick in. Right? <laughs> this is, okay, this is so good because you can see one of the things that I love most about reviewing Christian movies that are based on a true story is you can see the edges of the real conversation through the fugue state that ended up being the movie, which is like this guy, Stu, who sucked, showed up at confession and was like, I don't know why God hit me with a car. And the priest was like, ah, this asshole. I don't know. Maybe God has better plans for you. And Stu walked out of there being like, God especially wants me to be his very best friend. Yes, right. You can hear the priest opening a fortune cookie on the other side of the confessional. <laughs> <laughs> penny saved is a penny earned. <laughs> So, okay, so now yet again, we're at a bar. This time he's talking things over 
with with Ham. And Ham's like, he's like, what, what should I do? And he's like, I don't know, man, but whatever you do, it it, it really needs to initiate some kind of plot or something <laughs> like the the Gam guys are going to have nothing to fucking talk about. <laughs> I do have a dumb name, but you really got to move past that and do something else. <laughs> Yeah, his thing to Ham is he's like, maybe I'm secretly super awesome. And Ham's like, that's one idea. Let's throw yes, out a couple maybe, of ideas. Let's throw is, out a bunch whoo, of ideas. <laughs> Pin in that. Yeah, but they, then we have yet another montage. This is the him trying to figure out where to go from here montage. Mm -hmm. And it includes some jogging and some praying and some, some fucking spinning the wheel of plot. And sexually handling the rosary beads. Oh, yes. yes very sensually, yeah. And then he's yeah. like, priest. Perfect. <laughs> right. So, yeah, this montage ends with him at a diner with Carmen. And he tells her the big news. He's going to be a priest. Yeah. And Carmen's like, that's fucking dumb. And I'm like, yep, Carmen nailed it. She is not right often in this movie. Not only is it dumb, it's the only possible decision less likable than bad alcoholic who fucked a girl who's not supposed to have sex before marriage, right? Yeah. He basically takes her to a restaurant, gets down on one knee and is like, now you're just living in sin. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is rough. Like he just had sex with her for the first time. And he's like, so that was great. I'm going to be celibate now forever. Yeah. No, it's because it was so good. I don't want to ruin That's it. That's <laughs> what I've decided on. With other. I want it to be the last one. Sex. <laughs> okay. Not, not to have my own stake in the underpants moment, but just because someone becomes celibate right after they have sex with you doesn't necessarily mean that you weren't oh. awesome at it. And so this is where he tells her about seeing the Virgin Mary after his accident. And she's like, oh, well, you were hopped up on drugs in a coma after being heavily indoctrinated from with uh, Catholic imagery for the first time in your life. You saw Catholic imagery. I guess there's only one explanation for for that, right? Yep. But to be clear, the, the argument of the movie here is head trauma made him think more clearly, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also, like, 40 minutes of this movie has been this love story, which he is now going to slam dunk into a garbage can for the rest of the film. Yep. Yeah, and she even says, like, you know, I thought you were taking me here to propose. And I'm like, In that fucking diner? Really? You thought, I mean, I, I guess, you know, to each his own, but whoa. <laughs> so, and it was even worse than that. I thought about it, each, we would each have our own pan of steak at my house. But, <laughs> uh, you know, diner, right? Yeah. They do it. But no, I'm celibate now. Yeah. All right. Well, consider this incident incited at the end of act two. What's the incident? Holy fuck, do I need another break? So let me get back to the hard sell here. Uh, do they know about nonlinear storytelling? Can not having a plot be the plot? Ooh. Why didn't they stop making the movie when they realized that nothing interesting ever happened to this guy? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the plotting conclusion of Father Stew. Hey, podcast listener. As you've already heard, we like to do fun little sketches, songs, and bits for our advertisements. But seeing as we have a lot more of you than usual this week, our final sponsor is BetterHelp. And we just wanted to talk to you about it. Since we started advertising with BetterHelp, we've had literally dozens of listeners tell us it was their first chance at getting help from a licensed professional therapist. What's BetterHelp? Heath would only not do the sketch if he still got a point. It's both. I care about both equally. Equally? I mean, by which I mean different amounts, obviously, but... You know, BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. And we've had listeners who have trouble leaving home for a variety of reasons tell us that's a really great feature for them. It's affordable. They have financial aid and they have a wide variety of expertise that might not be available where you live. Yeah. So if you need a therapist who's, say, LGBTQ friendly or not going to try to sell you Jesus, they can help you with that. And God Awful Movies listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash awful. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash awful. So whether you're hearing us talk about BetterHelp for the first time or the 100th, give them a try. Our listeners really love the service, and we want you to get help if you need it. What's help if you need it? No. No, you don't get two you mark points. Mark me on two points. That's two. Break down whatever you want, but put it up your ass. Andrew's not going to ratify that. Now, Stu, what's this I hear about you wanting to become a priest? I'm telling you, Dad, I saw the Virgin fucking Mary when I got hit by a car. 
I totally got to be a priest now. Okay, son. But before that, you wanted to marry a stranger and you only saw her because you moved to L.A. on a whim to become a famous movie star. Yeah, yeah. Those were my dreams then. Well, they were because now I'm going to be a fucking priest. Right. Um, let me let me just check something real quick, Stu. The father, Stu. Nope. You can call me father, nope, Stu. Not yet. Nope. Uh, so, you see the front of that magazine with that cowboy on it? Oh, my God. I just realized I want to be a cowboy. Right. Yeah. Thought so. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to take a shit. I'm a piece of shit. You know what? That one you can keep. And we're back for the breakdown. We're going to rejoin Stu and Carmen running in to tell his mom about the priest thing, like two kids that each want to get their side of the story out first. <laughs> okay, this is another amazing mom moment, too. She's the best. He's like, hey, mom, big news. And she's like, you're in porn now? Yeah. <laughs> right away. And he's like, what? No. Why do you always guess that? It's always that. No, priest. I'm a priest. God damn it. She's like, I'm calling back to another one of you. I did the oil rig bit earlier. No, never mind. Right. Never mind. <laughs> right over your fucking head. But yeah, so, and Carmen's like, yeah, he's going to make a huge mistake. And she's like, mom's like, well, it's your fault, Carmen. And Carmen's like, no, it's your fault, mom. And 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 then Stu is, gets angry at them and storms out. He's like, take my idea I had just now seriously, damn it. Yeah. We also get this scene where he like sends his application into seminary school with basically a, a handwritten letter in crayon. This was fucking insane. Yeah, they, they, they try to play it as a comedy bit. But it's. It's not because it's based on a true story. Yeah. So what we're given to understand is that this absolute fucking nutcase wrote a letter being like, I priest now with a bag of wet fives and ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we get that scene and they're like, no, he'll never be a priest. That's for sure. And then he, we get him coming home and Mel Gibson is there to chew him out about this whole priest idea he's had. Yeah, he's like, if you're going to be a priest, you should just murder me. He pulls out a gun. Yeah. He pulls out a loaded gun and says, here, take this and shoot me in the fucking head if you're going to be a priest. And I'm like, you know, that's overly dramatic, but I do get it, right? Like, yeah. I do understand. No. Us atheists, we're very emotional about that. Kind of <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're going to stop being an atheist? Shoot me in the goddamn <laughs> face right now, my son. Yeah, that, that's typical. Yeah. Who hasn't heard the age old story of the atheist kicking his son out of the house because he doesn't follow the family's atheism? Yep. Jesus. So and then and Stu's like, I'm leaving and he leaves and Mel Gibson grabs the trash. I think he's going to throw it at Stu. We never see that. We never see it. We just watch Mel Gibson take out the trash because this is a documentary they combined into <laughs> shooting Moody footage. Yeah. Also, he got rejected from, from seminary school, right? Yeah. So he has into like fucking Catholicism headquarters to give him a what for. Yeah. Right? Because apparently he's pursuing the priesthood the way he pursued <laughs> Carmen. I actually considered doing this where I got waitlisted when I applied to colleges. I was like, I'm going to show up and ask them why I didn't get accepted. I feel like that'll be a good, <laughs> like I'll be able to present my case and they'll take it very well. And I might get in. There you go. I did not. It would have worked, Heath. You should have done it. Yeah, should have. Worked out great for Spider-Man. <laughs> so, and and look, I, there cannot possibly be more than eight people on earth that want to be Catholic priests. I like the least believable part of this movie where the Virgin Mary shows up and Jesus has a drink with him and shit is that the Catholic church is turning people down from priest fucking applications. I, I don't buy it. Oh, I'm sorry. Is he not moral enough to join your cabal of child rapists? Right. The Catholic church. Yeah. There's no good experience on the resume for magic. Like what? Right. What, 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 are they, what are they judging that based on? Have you ever turned any? Any crackers into flesh? I mean, I don't think. <laughs> Do you uh, write an essay? <laughs> but he goes into this one senior's office. There's a very like, if you don't let me be a priest, I'll punch you kind of vibe. But I guess the Monsignor just likes his pluck, right? Likes the cut of his jib. Yep. <laughs> so. I enjoyed that there was that moment of like, all right, well, there's nothing we can do because we're both lying evenly thing that Christians <laughs> yes. must get into. So like the Monsignor is like, well, God's not sure you're the best candidate. I spoke to God. God's like, mm, maybe not. And then Marky Mark's like, well, God wants me. I just, uh, sorry, I just had it. Bring, bring. God says <laughs> he does want me here. He reconsidered your conversation. And they're both ah. like, 
Fuck. Liar's impasse? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like when you watch two kids playing with a doll that they've both attributed sentience to. No, Mr. Minkin says he wants to be the doctor in my hospital. <laughs> yeah. Right. Damn it. Mr. Minkins does want to be the doctor in your hospital. <laughs> so, yeah, but whatever it is, it works because now we get the scene of him starting at Catholic Hogwarts or whatever. Yeah. Where he has to turn in all of his worldly goods. Is that real? Yeah. Yeah, they did. Like you, you turn in your wallet. You, they give you the, your money and shit, and all you get to keep is like your ID. I'm just. I wrote my notes. Like, there's no reason to do that shit that isn't creepy as all fuck. Yeah. So I, I googled this because I didn't know if this was just a dramatic flare. And like the fourth result I found was a Reddit thread about how often this practice is abused, and that like seminary students often don't have money for food. Yeah. It's like a weird. It's real culty. There's. No reason for the practice other than to abuse it. What the fuck? Right. What else? Yeah. Like, why would you need to do that? Right, exactly. So, but anyway, so and then with the, he meets his roommate, and they don't. His roommate's very stuffy, and he's not stuffy. They're not going to get along at all. Okay, <laughs> I watched this with Anna. She assures me that this roommate was in the movie before this point. I don't. I believe her. Don't also don't <laughs> believe her. I, I wrote in my notes because like he he walks into the thing and then we glance over and it's this guy and I'm like, are we supposed to recognize that guy? Yeah. So according to my wife, who again both Noah and I are pretty sure is making this up, <laughs> he was like judging. He was a priest in the church that he's been trying to go to, who's been like giving him the side eye throughout the movie. I again, I think oh, she's like making. It, I don't know why. That, okay, yeah, All exactly. Right, yeah, yeah. But it, that, she's probably right. But like, they didn't establish that well enough for me to know it in the moment. <laughs> so oh, also, okay, there's this weird fucking scene. So he doesn't. Him and his roommate don't get along. So now it's two o'clock in the morning, and Marky Mark is up late practicing his priestly bell ringing. But that's not a thing that you would practice. Nope. Sure isn't. <laughs> like, that is literally the example Chuck Berry came up with for something that Johnny B. Good could play a guitar <laughs> like that takes no effort. Mm -hmm. Okay, but again, Marky Mark, real life, I'm fucking nailing this bell at two in the morning. <laughs> yeah. There's no way that's not a real thing. He is he attempts to do the bell badly at the beginning of the scene. He does. He but does. it's a bell, so it works perfectly. It's so amazing. He picks it up and he's like, bing, bing, and he's like, fuck, ah, I didn't do it. I did do it. I, I did. did. You all heard There's no that. way to not do it. You can't pick this item up without I grab doing the that. little tongue. All right, all we're right. going to make a line of bells down the middle of the room, and then you're, <laughs> I don't know what this is. <laughs> Got to ring it with your ass cheeks. <laughs> we're trying to get a plot going. Yeah, right. We really need a plot at this point. <laughs> we need to go to a sitcom trope from 1990. <laughs> so, yeah, and then we get this, Um, you know, nobody believes in Stu. No one thinks he'll make a good priest shit talk moment. Yeah. And and then we get them all playing basketball together, all the priests, all the seminary students, except for stuffy roommate who's just studying the Bible instead. Yeah, he didn't learn how to play basketball. They take stuffy roommate and they like try to force a character onto him like they're cleaning up before parents get home. Right? He's like, oh, yeah, no, my dad never taught me to play basketball. He always wanted me to be a priest. And by the way, his name is Jeff. And I was just like, hey, guy, what? guy, there's 11 minutes left in this movie. Right. I don't give a fuck who you right. are. You had an hour and 15 <laughs> minutes if you wanted to give this character a personality. You can't do that now. Fuck you. Maybe take a little of the uh, Marky Mark's television is broken in the hotel room time and put it towards <laughs> this character. <laughs> Or all apologies to Heath. Take away some of the steak in a pan eating. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I was right. I mean, you got to keep some of that. But <laughs> they they did clearly have this little bit of basketball actually happen because Marky Mark in real life. And he really does like kind of know how to play basketball. So he was like, well, we're going to make me look good. And I'm going to have a little bit of basketball in there. Yeah. But literally <laughs> all they get is him being like, time out. This, is, this guy's black. I need a timeout. <laughs> and it was like, what is happening? Because he's talking about him, who is, by chance, an African-American person. And he calls timeout and says, this guy's black. I need a timeout. And so like, that's <laughs> that's the best they could get and keep mm -hmm. out of what happened while Marky Mark was playing basketball yeah, with this guy. Right. So, yeah. So it, that scene ends. And now we've got him, like, going back to his old church as a para cleric or whatever the next thing down from priest is. But he's going to preach in the kind of down home folksy and relatable way that this denomination needs. Darn it. OK, but his sermon is 
Apropos of nothing, if you had sex with me and you're <laughs> mad at me now and then because I immediately afterwards I wanted to be a priest, <laughs> you should forgive me. I'm preaching. Therefore, that's what God wants you to do. The end. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Carmen's sitting there going like, at least you didn't say my name out loud in it. <laughs> You're literally staring at me the entire time. Stop <laughs> listing the sexual positions we did. Please, please. <laughs> my mom's here. And then he ends. So he catches up to her afterwards. He's like, hey, did you notice that my really gross sermon was all about you and our fucking and how you shouldn't be mad at me anymore? And she's like, yes, I noticed. And I'm still mad at you. I did notice that, actually. Yeah. And he's like, so you dating anybody? End of scene. He literally. Yep. Yep. That happens in the movie. Uh, and apparently stuffy roommate narked on him. About this, because he, because like we see him see Marky Mark talking to Carmen. And then the next scene is the Monsignor giving him the, are you fucking a lady speech? <laughs> yeah, because we know how watchful the Catholic Church is for its priests and their sexual impropriety. At the, at the slightest whiff of sexual impropriety, nobody comes down harder than the Catholic Church. Well, you know, with a consenting woman, that's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, he promises not to fuck anybody. He's like, you know, I've won a lot of fights in my life. I can fight my sexual <laughs> urges for sure. Yeah. He basically says not having sex is just like a fist fight. And I was like, oh, that's actually accidentally a pretty good saying. <laughs> 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 not having sex is just like a fist fight. Yeah. yeah beat up. Yeah. So, but the Monsignor assures Stu that if he ever wants to talk about not fucking, he is available. Then they walk away and we, we get this scene where he like fantasizes about beating the fuck out of narc priest. But he doesn't. It's no. just comedy. Yep. <laughs> or that was Marky Mark's real life and they had to pretend it was a flashback. Oh, yeah, like, right. A yeah. Thing and not a real flashback. Okay. All right. This is making a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. It's all coming together. All right. So now they're playing basketball again. You remember when I said earlier that the incident was incited? I was lying. This is the actual inciting incident in the movie. Oh, this is this is it. Okay. Plot. All right. Yep. Ready. Here it comes. <laughs> Here it comes. We're an hour and 15 minutes into this review. But yeah. <laughs> so but he collapses on the basketball court and they try to help him stand up. But then he collapses again and they just. They just keep doing this. <laughs> okay. This was insane. I, I literally thought that I had like blacked out or had a vision of the future. He tries to walk. I, I think it was four times. I think you're right, actually. Because right, he's like, oh, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. Oops. Oh, no. Okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Oops. I, and then two more times. It's so I, long. I just got happier and happier and happier as uh, Mark and Mark As his, all his, his friends try to stand a weeble on its head. Yes. Yeah. I know you're not supposed to laugh at like degenerative muscle diseases, which no, we're about true. to learn this is. But when it's Marky Mark, it's funny. It just is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So we, we cut to him at the hospital. Doc comes in, tells him he has a rare condition that's not ALS, but it's like ALS. And here's how it's like ALS. And I'm like, again, Writers, just give him ALS. Just have it be ALS. Thank you. Why, Why would you, you have another We know thing? what that is. That's fine. It's actually referred to as Marsden Former Syndrome. Ah, yeah, nobody right. cares. Jesus. So he's like, yeah, you have an incurable muscular disease. You're going to waste away and you're going to die from it. And he's like, wow, is there any good news? He's like, well, your, your, your dick will still work for a very long time. He's like, I'm a priest. He's like, oh, well, then there was no way that anything was going to be good news. You're a fucking priest. You should priest. stop yeah. becoming a priest. Man. Yeah, right. Yeah. Can you uh, can you talk to your God and have him cure this disease, which I've already bring, I can't bring. cure? Hold on, I just did it for you. <laughs> stop becoming a priest, he said. Uh, and, and we have to do that several times, right? We have to keep examining the downside of believing in magical bullshit because the next scene is Ham telling him, ah, you know, them doctors might just be underestimating the awesome power of God. Right. right? And hey, spoiler alert, he does not get better. He dies nope. of this thing. Yep, exactly. He dissolves into a puddle of goo and dies. So the movie, you can watch the movie being very light-handed with the power of God stuff in this scene. It's like, I don't know, maybe God's got um, a, a, a goo-based path for you. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, and then, okay, so Ham roasts muscular dystrophy for a little while, and then Marky Mark goes to a church for a little yell crying. Oh, and I was like, this whole movie might be worth watching just for Marky Mark's desperate Oscar clip here. Yeah. Is this a bingo square yet? The ugly crying at God scene? Oh, no, I don't think it but is. It needs to be. 
It needs to be. It's somewhere between spicy food and the 20th shit of the day. <laughs> oh, so this went on for so long that I get the feeling the director was afraid Marky Mark was going to punch him if he said cut. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. They just sent him in with a GoPro and they were like, whatever you do in there, man, we'll put it in the movie. <laughs> Eli, do you get to a weeping situation at the 20th? Yes, Is that what you're saying? Do you not? I don't get to a 20th. I mean, well, but you would trust me. You would be weeping. Maybe you I would. would. That's fair. Yeah. Thank you. I do enjoy how. Okay. So these ugly crying scenes there, you know, it's you're talking to God every time, even in Christian movies. They don't get an answer. God never is like, yeah, so it is uh, it is a goo-based thing, but trust me, it's going to work out. Why not have that happen once in a while? Might as well. Yeah, it's your movie. We've already had Jesus show up as a fucking drunken meth head at a bar. We might as well. His mom was there to cradle you during a head injury. Why not have God show up in the pew next to you to be like, trust me, you're going to make a movie that makes $30,000 opening <laughs> weekend. It's going to go great. <laughs> I think this movie's Stop. making money right now. No, yeah. don't say that. Yeah, is. probably. We're all having a good time. <laughs> don't ruin it. Marky Mark's net worth is really big. No. All right. So, but this scene wraps up. He calls his mom, and his mom's like, uh, "Don't you have Catholic magic? Is that not going to help? Huh? Huh? No, it's not because it's fairy tales. That's why." I'm like, "Go, mom." Yep. It's three hundred million. I just checked. God damn it! <laughs> why did you do that? I thought it was. We were enjoying. We were having a good time. We were having a lovely time. I thought it was going to be smaller. Enjoying our movie review. I forgot about Wahlburgers. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I, I hear those are very good. So mom calls Mel Gibson and she's like, hey, you know, your son has not ALS, but like ALS. Are you just a cameo in this movie? Or are you going to do something here? And he's like, ah, I guess so. What would you say you do in this movie? Right. And he's like, I guess I'll be a large part of the next seven scenes. Fine. First, the question, can he shit by himself? That's his first, that's his first question when dad hears that the kid has a muscular dystrophy thing. He's like, can he shit? Because I'm not coming over there. And then we get to actually do some of that. So yeah. that, that's fun in yeah. the movie. Yeah. I guess it's better than karaoke. Sure, yeah, they, they set a low bar. They should have combined it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, but the next day, Stu comes to visit Mel at his trailer. Stu is, uh, makes a classist remark, and then Mel makes both a racist and then an ableist remark, and it's like, oh, you win. You win the bigotry contest that we suddenly... There's an amazing moment. They're going back and forth with their bigotry contest, and it pans over to their black neighbor at this trailer park for a second, who's just like, you guys suck. Your documentary crews talk about you when you're not acting. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Go back to their scene. We should also point out, by the way, that... By this point in the movie, Marky Mark has given up on whatever accent he was trying for at the beginning. Right? It was selective <laughs> throughout, but he's not even doing that anymore. He's just doing the Marky Mark voice now. I think maybe mentally in his head, they put the fat suit on him and he was like, I slowed down talking, so I'm not doing, it's not Cajun or fast anymore because <laughs> he's an idiot. Okay, so this is my best worst. I want to talk about it. At the very end of the movie, spoiler, we get some clips of the actual guy and he was fat. He was fat. Sure. So I think Marky Mark was like, hey, there is no conceivable way people will see me on screen, the beautiful epitome <laughs> of human being that I am, and understand that I'm dying. We must put me in a Jiminy Glick secondhand <laughs> fat suit for the rest of the film. It's that level. I don't remember what... What was Jar Jar Binks? The fa remember Jar Jar Binks had like heads of his his people who had big toad waddles. Them, it's the he stole one of those costumes from the set of Episode One. No, yeah, no, he was sumo wrestling in a balloon at some kind of tourist trap. Yeah. yeah. It was incredible. We're not quite there yet, though. It's like he had to roll a D10,000 and he got blown up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like stole the gum from Willy Wonka. Yeah, something exactly. along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> and then, okay, so we get a, a quick montage of his muscles degenerating. He sees Carmen and she can't come right out and say, wow, I'm glad we didn't get married now, though. So she doesn't. No. They have this very touching moment where it's like, oh, if only we'd been married or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And she cries and he wipes her tear away, but his hands are Krabby Claws now. Mm -hmm. So there's this vi okay. this moment that the movie <laughs> wants me hilarious. to take very seriously where he like clubs at her face. <laughs> it's, 
You see her just like kind of like I, flinching each time. He's, it would be better. Just, don't just, I, okay. Ow. Just, ow I, knuckle. I did. Ow. I know your eye. hands work in real life. You're committing to this too much. <laughs> just softer. Too hard. So, but even though, even though he's degenerating and in a fat suit, he's still doing his priestly duty. So now we get Stu and Narc Priest going to a prison to minister to the sinful or whatever. And Narc Priest doesn't know how to talk to cons at all, but Stu sure does. Stu does, because let's let's all agree, the first and best thing you can say to a room full of convicted prisoners is, your wife is probably fucking someone else right now. <laughs> well, and of course, in this stupid movie, everybody's like, wait, he just said fucking, maybe we should hear this guy out. He speaks like us. Maybe one can buy indulgences from the papal core if they've been approved up at the Monsignor <laughs> level. <laughs> Give that spider a chance. Yeah, but and his message here to the cons, by the way, is that nobody gives a fuck about you except for an imaginary guy that somebody made up to oppress your ancestors. How does that make you feel? Better? And they're like, yeah, better. No, much yeah, better. Yeah, much better. No, I appreciate it. It's <laughs> great. It's awesome of you to come and do this. But but there's some bad news that comes with this, right? Because the next scene is where he gets called into the Monsignor's office to be told that he can't be a priest. Because he's going to drop the magic crackers. Right. Yeah, they're like, we. you would probably fuck it up, dude. Like, honestly. So, okay, first of all, could you imagine any other job doing this? Right, exactly. Like, virtually, like, even if you had a job where, like, you would be physically incapable of doing your job anymore, they would probably be like, hey, look, we, we found, like, a, a lighter position that you can do until you don't feel like working anymore. But, of course, they can't, you can't not make the Catholic Church evil in a movie Right. Because they're the Catholic Church. And so they're like, yeah, we think where you would make us look bad. Yes. And by the way, the job is nothing. Yep. Right. There is absolutely nothing about like and the priest has to hold the crackers the whole time in a nope. hand that works. <laughs> nope. He can have a cracker holder. Yeah. <laughs> right. But in, in the movie's head, a degenerative muscle disease is like. Okay, well, next week, your left arm falls off. That's when that happens. Well, yeah. And then you lose <laughs> your entire right leg after that. And, like, that's how, <laughs> that's the timeline of this thing. So, they're like, yeah, it's it's going to be really bad in, like, three weeks. So, yeah, you can't do it. But let's be honest here, right? To the extent that this is a true story, what probably is happening here is that they're like, hey, look, man, if our priests are, like, dying of these terrible conditions, it really highlights that we're full of shit. Right. Right. And that our God doesn't exist or care about anyone. And that's why they wouldn't want him as a priest. Right. A priest who is wasting away from a muscle disorder is a punchline, not a fucking inspiration. Well, I don't know if it's a punchline, but yeah. So, okay. So Stu goes back to the church to yell at God some more. This is where he ends up actually crawling on his hands and knees towards the Virgin Mary statue, just like Carmen's dad talked about earlier. Oh. Foreshadowing, right? The writer was way too proud of that. Mm -hmm. And then Mel Gibson gets a call from Ham saying like, hey, man, can you come get your your kid? He's lying on the floor of our church and he won't leave. His left calf exploded just now. Yeah, He's kind of stuck there. So <laughs> We're not sure when the right calf's going to go so nobody else wants to walk up to him. Yeah. We've all got on those things from the Gallagher show, just in case. But, you know, <laughs> that's real wood those pews are made out of. And so, so Mel shows up to get him. Uh, he's just sprawled out the, on the floor using the, uh, a step as a pillow. And he's like, y you have to get up. And he's like, I I I'm not going to get up. And he's like, no, you have to. He's like, I literally physically can't, though. Somebody would have to put me back into my, into my wheelchair at this point. And then... I feel like they were hoping someone would write an inspiring end to this scene, but no one did. Literally, Mel Gibson's just like, these pews are nice. <laughs> he actually says that. He does. He's like, no, it's a flush and plum. Yeah, and you nice. measure twice, cut once. I do like the craftsmanship on these. This mahogany? But the whole thing was like, okay, you don't lose for getting knocked out. You lose when you don't get back up. And then that's the end. The end of the scene is just Mark and Mark being like, I, I lose then because I'm of physically the, incapable of, of getting back up though. So. ALS, but not that. So, yeah. so <laughs> this is just getting darker and darker. What, what happens at the end of this? Yeah. And, and, and then we watch Stu try to take a shit for a while. Cool. That's how you ramp it down. Cool. He banters with his dad while he takes a shit. His dad's like, Hey, it takes you too long to take a shit. Cause your body's breaking down. And he's like, Oh hey, yeah, well, your father's like a really prominent Holocaust tonight. Like, like, <laughs> 
<laughs> one of the most famous Holocaust deniers in the world. All right, and all right. So Ty, fine, Ty. <laughs> you want to do karaoke while we do this? <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so we get a whole like a whole scene of him trying to take a shit, and then now Dad is taking Stu to church. Right? Dad doesn't know how to tie a tie either. Huh? So, but but they they are driving him to church, but damn it, if the truck doesn't break down and they have to wheelchair the whole rest of the way. Oh, uh, why was this necessary? I, I don't know because the movie looking, had gone on so long at this point. It's just yeah. like, just have him show up. Looking man. back, just start the scene, man. Why why are you doing this? Nothing right? happens yeah. here. Yeah, it was so that we could get some more great back and forth banter between him and his dad. Like fuck you, no fuck you. Right get in the chair. Yeah. So yeah, so they get to the church and all the named characters are there from the whole movie. Okay, so when this did, did you think they were giving him a surprise like death wedding to Carmen when this happened? Yes, that is in my fucking nose. Carmen's there; she's dressed in white, right? And I'm like, oh, is he get? Are, is this a surprise wedding? And no, it's not. Is that a thing? Do people do surprise death weddings? Like, oh, you're about to die. Let's get a wedding in there. I, I get it in there. don't think that they do. I feel like Eli's planning this. Eli, you have to be honest. I are, am, you planning, I am are you setting this up? This for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he actually has asked me to set it up. And it's very unlikely that he'll still be there. Wait till you see who I have you marrying. It's, <laughs> it's a pretty good goof. I got you. I got you good. <laughs> so, but no, he's not having a surprise wedding. He's having a surprise ordination. Surprise! It turns out that they're going to make him a real priest after all. Yeah. And to show how much they believe in him, they lay him out on the floor like a fucking runner. Okay, so that, I guess, that actually is part of the ordination process. That you have to lay on the floor and, and put your head on the ground or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he nails this. I, I don't know <laughs> why you guys didn't think he'd be good at being a priest. So far, he's crushing it. Oh, man, he's amazing. <laughs> and then we flash back to earlier in the movie, the, the fucking singing fat lady of Christian cinema there. Mm-hmm. And then he's going to give a, a like a genuine sermon as a genuine priest. And he's so good at it that he even gets through to Mel Stone Cold Heart. OK, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that, like, they do actually repeat the real Catholic doctrine of suffering here, which is fucking horrifying. Yep. And like, look, we're used to horrifying messages in the movies we review. But like to sit there and watch Marky Mark be like, no, um, sorry, let me explain my suffering with this degenerative muscle disease is literally the suffering of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ felt all suffering on the cross. So this is me being closer to Jesus and is a good thing. That's why Mother Teresa didn't give all of those children pain medication. Yep. We're the good guys. Yep. Okay. That sure is. That's why when my mom went to Catholic churches as a kid, she wasn't allowed to scratch itches because she was supposed mm. to offer up that pain Are and suffering serious? to the people. Yes. Yeah, if she got caught scratching an itch, she'd get in trouble. Because Jesus itched on the cross for our sins? Yes, yeah. What the fuck? Itched for us all. He felt every itch. <laughs> it must have been very annoying. <laughs> okay, his exact words at one point were, God gave me the scenic route to die, right? Isn't that what he said? Yep. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that like the ALS or whatever he has, is like a final destination scenario. So like he was supposed to die in the car accident, the motorcycle accident. And then like, God was like, all right, well, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And eventually what would the movie wrap up that loose even end. be about if you died at this point? I guess. We're gonna, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where's that final destination movie where everyone's just getting like ALS <laughs> lung cancer? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can't run from that shit. <laughs> Finding a lump in their boob. <laughs> yeah. Man, emphysema, final destination emphysema was a really slow movie. It was really slow. And also, so th th this is just a weakness in Christian mythology, right? Because every story has to end with, but then a mentally ill carpenter got tortured to death. And that kind of puts a hard cap on how good your stories can be, right? Yeah. He had to end there. So it, it, we get his little sermon. Then he enters into an uh, assisted living facility. We watch Mel Gibson stare sadly with flags waving behind him. So that's the fucking Mel Gibson fat lady is singing, right? Mm -hmm. And then we get we we find out that everyone in town comes to this hospice to see Father Stu. He's so popular, which I feel like would be weird, right? Like it's an adult assisted living facility, and they're like, "Oh, hi, who are you here to visit?" And it's like, "I'm I'm here to confess to a, a priest who's dying here." <laughs> 
Yeah, right. No, I do you mind setting up two folding tables so that I can do perfect confession with him? <laughs> yeah, and so then we we get, of course, Narc Priest comes to confess to Stu and 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 explain that he really had a personality this whole time and even a character arc if you think about it. I'm going to put this on my IMDb page and everything. Okay, get out of the movie. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but he tells this whole story about how you know, his whole life, his dad wanted to be a priest and he didn't want to be a priest. And he sure is jealous of, of that degenerative muscle condition that Father Stu got, because if he got one of those, he wouldn't have to be a priest. And I'm like, what, yeah. what are you trying to sell us on here, guys? I don't <laughs> I get it, but I don't know why. Also, whose dad grows up wanting them to be a priest? Like, pastor, I can understand, but like. Who's like, God, I hope my kid never fucks. <laughs> <laughs> the oh. line must end here. <laughs> I feel like it's actually a good amount of dads. <laughs> and still clinging to life like a fucking cockroach, this movie keeps going. Right? Like they, That is the place to end it. Stu gives him the little saint necklace that Carmen gave him, and it's just like, all right, now we can end. But no, God damn it, Mel Gibson wanted to be in the last scene. Yeah. No, it's a, this is classic storytelling. You do the hospice scene, but then you do a wedding or um, Alcoholics Anonymous. One of the yeah, an AA meeting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, Mel's going to an AA meeting and he explains that, you know, he was a bad dad, but now he's Catholic. So that doesn't matter. Another thing I'm surprised to see them admitting to. Right. Just be a massive piece of shit and say you're sorry. The end. Our religion. But it's not the fucking end because then we have to watch Mel go home and we found out that Mel and, and mom are back together. And I'm like, oh, good. The verbally and psychologically abusive husband is back with her. That's a happy ending. Fun. Good. This was redemption for the movie, right? They were saying that like, yeah. All right. Well, it's too late for Mel Gibson to be a good dad, but he's going to go have sex with his ex-wife who he was probably horribly abusive to the entire time. And now... Now he's redeemed himself. Yes. Yep. Yep. I think that's the that's the point of the movie. Well, I mean, they're dancing in the kitchen, so it must be true and abiding love this time. Yeah. Abusive couples are never unhappy. No. And and then we get this movie's Breakfast Club close, right? Where it goes like, and then Stu, it died. I mean, he died. He, he did die. He did. He did. Right die. after this. Of that disease. Yeah. God gave him. God, <laughs> this it went downhill so bad. It started as the story of a boxer. That's a movie. <laughs> and that would end with like, you know, winning at boxing yep. usually or losing no. at boxing in an important way. No, it went from boxer or tying to, in boxing. Or tying, if you think yes. that's but with the greatest boxing movies. They're, of all time they're punch it. at the same time. Exactly. But it, it's like, no, ALS, slow death, troubleshitting, full death. Yep. The end. You want to watch some home movies of the real guy? He was fat. So it, it explains the fat suit. <laughs> Oh Jesus. God! Even the guy, even the interview with the real guy, you're like, wow, this this dude just really had nothing interesting to say at all, right? It was like if 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 Dave Warnock had decided to lie instead of the thing he's doing now, <laughs> it's not super interesting. Whew. So, but like seriously, okay. So, what was the moral of this story? Uh, Catholic Church now accepting applications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No idea. No, uh, uh. Nothing. That really should have ended with a zip recruiter ad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it looks like that's going to do it for our review of Father Stupid. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to earn a paycheck next week. So, Eli, tell us, what's on deck? Well, Noah, when Donald Trump holds a pity party showing a documentary about how he did to win the election at Mar-a-Lago, you know we're going to end up watching it, yeah. too. So we'll be checking out Rigged. The Zuckerberg-funded plot to defeat Donald Trump. Oh, that's <laughs> lucky us. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 349 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing A, The Citation Data, d d Minus, and The Skeptic Out, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawful movies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slot and people drafts on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bostig, I'm no illusions promising to work hard or earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club clothes. Mel Gibson continued evolving into the mascot for a segregated vodka company. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's what he looks like now. Statistically speaking, at least two of the characters in this movie raped children. Yeah. Marky Mark has told several press outlets that he'll only be making religious films moving forward. In unrelated news, Eli has two wishes left. <laughs> <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. We want students to know that if they go to Kent State, they have the world a la carte as an opportunity for them to develop a true global perspective.